Good afternoon and welcome. I have to put on my magnifying glasses so I can actually see what I'm going to be saying. My name is Kimberly Bookman. I'm a TV reporter with Channel 7 News and I'm thrilled to be here with you today to kick off Women's History Month. And we have some pretty remarkable women here in the city that we are going to be celebrating today. You know, in my line of work, I've encountered lots of different types of women, as you can probably imagine. There are those that look you over, consider that you are competition, and work against you. There are those that don't look at you at all and care only about their own advancement. And then there are those that don't just look at you, but actually see you. They hold out a hand, they welcome you, they help you, they cheer you on. This March, Women's History Month, I urge you all to grab your glasses and not just notice the talent, the work, the accomplishments, the grace of the women around you, but celebrate it. That's what we are going to do here today. Now, allow me to take you back in time to the spring of 1776. That's when a woman, the city of Quincy likes to claim as its own, Mrs. Abigail Adams, wrote a letter to her husband, John Adams. In it, she urged her husband and the other members of the Continental Congress to remember the ladies and protect women's rights in the new American government. Fast forward to the present day and the city of Quincy is remembering that special lady by creating an award in Abigail Adams' name that honors female movers and shakers. Gathered on this stage today are the recipients. They are here on my left-hand side. They represent history, education, arts and culture, health and wellness, and the nonprofit community here in Quincy. You'll hear more about each of them in just a bit, but first I would like to recognize Mayor Koch, who spoke just briefly, and the First Lady, Christine Koch. You want to both stand up just so we can say hello? Thank you. So glad that they are both here with us today and for their support of this event. As many of you know, just months ago, the city of Quincy unveiled the Abigail Adams statue on the Hancock Adams Common. Abigail deserves all of these accolades. Described as a woman ahead of her time, a wife, a mother, first lady of our nation, and strong women's advocate, we are thrilled to be celebrating in her honor today. The women that we honor today have, through their own private and professional lives, impacted the Quincy community in a positive way. So without further ado, let's get to our first honoree. This woman is recognized in the historic category. She is Abigail Nabby Smith, the oldest child and only surviving daughter of President John and First Lady Abigail Adams. 
It is my pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Sarah Martin of the Massachusetts Historical Society to speak about NABI. Sarah. Thank you, Kimberly, and thank you for inviting me to take part in this wonderful event today. I always love talking about an Adams, and I think going to Kimberly's statement, uh, Abigail Nabby Adams definitely would have been one of those women that lifts others up throughout her life. As Kimberly said, she was the oldest surviving daughter, um, or the oldest child and only surviving daughter of John and Abigail Adams. She was born in July 1765, and she lived here in Quincy, then Braintree, and Boston uh, until the 1780s when she accompanied her mother to Europe. It was there that she met and married Colonel, Colonel William Stephen Smith, and they returned to New York. They had four children, three of whom survived to adulthood, and they spent their life in New York, kind of moving around a bit because of financial challenges. But she came home to Quincy when she was struggling with breast cancer, and it was there that she died at the age of 48 in 1813. Now this paints Nabby's life in really broad strokes. As the editor-in-chief of the Adams Papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society, it is my great joy to transcribe, edit, and publish Nabby's letters along with three generations of the writings from the Adams family. Nearly 100 letters survive that Nabby wrote. These range from a charming 1779 missive to a cousin while she was on a visit to Mercy Otis Warren, to an absolutely distressing September 1811 letter to Dr. Benjamin Rash, whom she was consulting about her breast cancer. In addition to these letters by Nabby, another 200 exist that were written to her. And with all of these letters, it becomes possible not just to paint her strokes in broad details, but really to get into those moments that enliven her experience. And today I thought I would share just a couple brief with you. A favorite of mine is from John Adams in 1777. He wrote, you have discovered in your childhood a remarkable modesty, discretion, and reserve. I hope these great and amiable virtues will rather improve in your riper years. To be good and to do good is all we have to do. Nabi spent her childhood, as many New England girls did, at her mother's side learning how to manage a household. But Abigail also believed in female education. And so Nabi attended school in Boston for a time. She had tutors, and she learned French, among many other subjects. When she wasn't studying or doing household chores, she enjoyed reading, playing cards, and gossiping with her cousins. In the mid-1780s, Nabi accompanied her mother to Europe, where they spent several years in England and France, as John Adams continued to represent the new United States in the diplomatic courts of Europe. Nabi and her mother attended scientific lectures, the theater, they socialized with Americans in Paris and London, and they attended the royal courts in both countries. In 1785, Abigail wrote her brother, John Quincy, a really interesting moment. I'll tell you what, she said, I like the king better than the queen. At least he dissembles better. She is a haughty, proud, imperious dame, and I believe feels excessively mortified to see our family at her drawing room. For which reason I should choose to go often. And of course, she's talking about George III and Queen Charlotte's court. You snap back to the fact that this was written in 1785. We're barely two years away from the signing of the peace treaty. John Adams is in London as the very first United States minister at the court of St. James. The tension's really palpable. <laughs> Right? As you've got the Adams family over there, these upstart Americans who fought the mighty British and won. I just love that little kind of, all of that 
is contained in those two sentences that Nabby wrote to her brother. And here's another fun fact about Nabby while she was in Europe. She served as John Adams' secretary at times. So John Adams had a secretary. It was William Stephen Smith. Nabby ends up marrying him. He wasn't always reliable, and Nabby was. And so we have many letters that were copied into John Adams' letter books at the Massachusetts Historical Society that are in Nabby's handwriting. But in another letter to John Quincy, we find a little bit more. A letter from Mr. Jefferson came by post today. He writes in cipher, and when there was nobody else to cipher or decipher, I have the agreeable task. I am paid, perhaps, for my trouble by knowing what is written. So, a couple things about this. One, it shows the trust that her father set by her to do these tasks and to help him with his work. It also shows that she is really an insider when it comes to some of the most confidential information that's circulating among the diplomatic corps in Europe. Um, and in this specific instance, what she has done is deciphered a 1785 letter from Thomas Jefferson to John Adams detailing the diamond necklace affair. And if you don't know about the diamond necklace affair, you should look it up. But it's got all the makings of a fantastic scandal, right? Fabulous jewelry, mistresses, and monarchy, the whole tale. And the end of it, the French monarchy comes off again looking as excessive as they would then um, kind of be held to task in the French Revolution. Now, while Nabby was in Europe, back to the secretary, William Stephen Smith, um, she met him. He was the secretary to the American legation, and they met and married in 1786, and they returned to the United States two years later. Nabby spent the next decade of her life in New York. If you know anything about William Stephen Smith, you know that he was a bit starstruck. He was always looking for the next best thing, the get-rich-quick scheme, bit of a, a shyster, shall we say. But um, those fortunes had great highs, saw them build a beautiful mansion on Broadway in New York City, but barely get to live in it because their financial fortunes reversed. And that saw them moving to the outskirts of New York City in East Chester, and eventually to the hinterlands of New York State, to Smith's Valley near Lebanon. During the last decade of her life, Nabi became a frequent and often extended visitor to her parents' home in Quincy. It was there that she sought medical counsel and treatment for her breast cancer, and it was there that she died in August 1813. And I'll leave you with perhaps some of Nabi's sagest advice. We have all some failings. None of us are perfect, and let us cultivate a little candor in judging of others. As we mark Women's History Month, I offer you this brief introduction to Abigail Adams Smith as a way to remember the ladies who throughout history have always been active and significant participants in our shared story. Today, I congratulate all of the honorees who continue to demonstrate in the countless ways how women impact, improve, and advance our society. Thank you, and thank you. The second honoree in the education category is Erin Perkins. Erin, stand up. Erin is the assistant superintendent at the Quincy Public Schools, and her sister, Susan Foley, will present her.
Hello, thank you for having me here today on this day to celebrate the ladies of Quincy. It is my pleasure to have this opportunity to speak to all of you today about my sister, Erin Perkins. I know that both Erin and our mother are currently on the edges of their seats, wondering and perhaps worrying about what I might say <laughs> and what stories I, as the younger sister, might tell over these next few minutes. So I want to start by putting their minds at ease. Don't worry, Mom. I promise I will be nice. <laughs> I have known Erin, well, my whole life. As she and others can attest to, I don't usually have a shortage of words. Oftentimes, I have too many. But in preparing for today, I got a bit stuck. I really struggled with how to encapsulate my sister in just a few words. It's not easy because there are so many stories and so many memories to comb through. You see, it's a pretty amazing and awesome thing to travel through life with a constant companion, as Erin and I have. With the exception of 15 short months in which she was the only child, <laughs> months she might claim were the best in her life, but I strongly disagree. We've been together through it all. And while there may have been a few bumps, there have been way more highs than lows. Erin and I have encountered and celebrated all life's milestones together. We were children together, playing in our yard on Kendall Street and in the pool on Viden Road. We weathered the teenage years together, went through high school together, visited each other's colleges, and had way more than our share of fun in our early adulthood. We traveled the world together, began our careers in education together, stood up for each other at our respective weddings, and now are raising our children and working in the QPS together. Yikes, that is a lot of together. <laughs> And all that togetherness has given me a lot of insider information on Erin to share with you. I really think to understand who Erin is, you need to start with the family we grew up in. Erin, our brother Patrick, and I grew up in a family with a few truths that we all just knew. The first of these won't come as a surprise to many, and that is that education was not just important, it was and is the family business. That isn't to say our parents pushed us into teaching. They didn't. It was more that education in general, and the QPS in specific, was just a huge part of our lives. As very little kids, our dad was the principal who lived in the neighborhood he worked in, which also happened to be the neighborhood he grew up in. He walked to work, and all the kids in the neighborhood knew him and loved him. And from that very young age, we thought that that connection to school and community was pretty awesome. As we got older, our dad moved to Broadmeadows as principal, and quickly we were as comfortable there as we were in our own schools. We knew the names of the students, we heard all the stories, and we attended all the plays and concerts. Around this same time, our mother returned to work as a first grade teacher at what was then the Furnace Brooks School and is now Bernazani. When she did, we added another school to our list. We loved to go in in late August and help her set up her classroom, and we visited her there often. We have clear, but not quite fond memories of walking around and around the dining room table, assembling her phonics packets, getting her ready for the year ahead. What it boils down to is the QPS is in our blood. Always has been, and I think it always will be. A second thing that was just a given in our family is a strong sense of Quincy pride. It's the city our parents were raised in, the city they raised us in, and the city they spent their careers ser serving. The Quincy versus North Quincy rivalry was fought out not just on the field, but at our Thanksgiving table. No kids were as excited for Quincy's bicentennial celebration as we were. I can't really put it into words. We just grew up in a family that loves this city. And because of that, making our careers here was kind of a no-brainer. The final truth of our upbringing, and the most significant, is the importance of family. Erin, Patrick, and I were so lucky to grow up in a home where we knew we were loved and we knew both our immediate and extended family had our backs. And that continues to be the case today. I know my mother told us countless times when we were growing up and squabbling over something that we would someday be happy to ha have each other in our lives. And surely she was right. Our family is big, it's noisy, and it's amazing, all rolled into one. I mention all these things because Erin is the sum of all these truths. She tried, I think, for a short time to avoid the fate of being an ed educator. I'm pretty sure I remember at one point she was going to be an actress, but the writing was on the wall. Erin is the consummate educator. 
She has dedicated the last 20 plus years of her life to the QPS, selflessly working for the good of, good of thousands of students, teachers, and staff. And QPS has been all the better for it. I tease Erin a lot, mainly while I'm sitting by her pool in the summer, about giving up her summers off for upper administration's 52 week a year schedule. But I know she is where she needs to be, working with Superintendent Mulvey and the leadership team to make the QPS the best it can be. With her background, her skills, and her passion, she could easily find a position in any number of places. But the idea of working or living outside the city of Presidents is as foreign an idea to her as it was to my parents. She is 100% dedicated to the city of Quincy and its children, and she works tirelessly for them. But that isn't to say that Erin is all work and no play, because she certainly is not. Because just as our parents taught us, for Erin, family still comes first. Outside of work, our Erin is a homebody, homebody who loves nothing more than being at home and preferably in bed by 8.30. She not only loves her boys, but she really enjoys her time with them. Her nieces and nephews know she is the one to go to to get what they want. I frequently hear my own children say, Auntie Erin said, just as we grew up in a family knowing our parents, aunts and uncles all had our backs, her kids and her nieces and nephews know no one is in their corner more than Erin. And that big, noisy, family, noisy, amazing family I mentioned has only gotten bigger, noisier, and more amazing. In preparation for today, I spent a few minutes looking at Erin's bio that's in the program that you have in front of you. And I think there were a few things that were missed that round out the picture of who Erin is. In addition to the things mentioned there, Erin is a fierce gardener on a quest to create the most perfect backyard. She is the proud owner of the largest, most luxurious bathroom you could possibly imagine. <laughs> she has not a lot of spare time, but in it, she watches all the TV shows, and she loves to talk about them. She is a terrible driver, I'm sorry, but it's true, but she skis with perfect form and is always at the front of the pack. She is wickedly funny and loves to laugh. She has a great singing voice and is always up for singing along to the radio in two-part harmony. Let's be honest, she's got a bit of an online shopping problem, but she balances it by being extremely generous. She's loyal, she's dedicated, and she's a whole lot of fun. She's positively impacted the lives of countless children, and Quincy, and more importantly, our family, is all the better for having her. In case I haven't made it quite clear today, or over the last 40-something years, I respect and love my sister a lot. Fred Rogers once said in talking about teachers, anyone who does anything to help a child in his life is a hero, or her life, is a hero to me. My sister has helped thousands of children, and none more so than hers and mine. So to me, that makes her one of my heroes. But don't tell her, I have a reputation to protect. <laughs> it's a funny coincidence that the theme for today is remember the ladies, because this is a phrase my siblings and I grew up very familiar with. As part of the aforementioned Quincy Pride, Quincy history was also very important in our house. And from my young age, my father frequently told us the stories of Abigail's letter to John. I don't know if many parents entertain their children by quoting the founding fathers, but that's how we rolled in our house. So it seems very fitting that Aaron is receiving this award today. I couldn't be more proud and honored to be a part of this day, recognizing and remembering all these great women, but in, my, in particular, my sister, Erin Perkins. Thank you, Susan. That was really unbelievable, um, <laughs> and uh, just unbelievably nice. So, and I love you, and I thank you for being my sister. So, I have a few people that I just want to thank for um, this. Uh, this is just unbelievable to me. It's really a great honor. I want to start by thanking Mayor Koch and Mrs. Koch for um, considering me for this honor. I, 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 Abigail is one of my heroes, so to be here today in her name is just amazing. 
And Mayor Koch, I just have to thank you for all the support that you personally have provided me, but also the city of Quincy. I can remember making copies at your copy machine in the Park Department office when I was 16 years old, and you've been there for me ever since, and I cannot thank you enough for that. Um, and I, I also just need to thank the people that are here today from Coddington. I have a whole family that exists at that school system. I see some school committee members here. I see Emily Lebo. It's really, um, you cannot do this work without a community of people to support you. And I am so fortunate that I have the community that I have. I have to thank um, Kevin Mulvey. I don't think that there is a superintendent and an assistant superintendent, maybe in the whole country, but certainly not in the state of Massachusetts, that get along and, and work together as well as we do. I have a partner every day, and I am so fortunate. I love my job, and part of that is because of the support that he, he provides and, and gives the entire school system. So for that, I am so thankful. I also, in sitting over there as well as my family, um, my aunts, my uncles, my boys, Dylan and Andrew, my husband, Sean, my, you know, um, my uncle David sitting right there. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I could not do this work. There, you know, there is a lot of sacrifice that comes with the, a job like we have, and without their support to be there when I need them to be there, um, it, it, I, it would not be possible. And so for that, I am forever grateful. My husband, Sean, um, you know, is Mr. Mom many of the time, and uh, I definitely could not do this without him. Um, and so just a couple more people. I don't think, as Susan mentioned, I don't think I would be the person today if it wasn't for my mother and father. They were instrumental in my life, and everything I do today, everything I have today, I owe to them. I, in particular, want to thank my mom, because I think that oftentimes, growing up in the house that we did with the father as a superintendent, um, you know, my mom gave up an awful lot. She did an awful lot on her own. Uh, when my dad couldn't be there uh, because he was doing things for the city. And so she was taking care of us. And so uh, she made me the woman that I am today. And so for that, I thank you. Um. And just finally, I just can't even tell you how honored I am to be here recognizing one of the women that I think uh, and love and respect so much, uh, Abigail Adams. What she did for her country, what she did for women, uh, I am in complete awe. I don't know that if I had been alive at the time when she was alive that I would have been able to sacrifice as much as she did for, um, for our great country, but she did it, and we are here today, and the women in the audience, we have what we have because she started it. She paved the way, and I am honored to live in the city, live in where in the area that she grew up in, and to represent the community that she grew up in, and uh, I, would, I would do it all again. I would dedicate every minute I have for the city of Quincy. I'm a, I am proud to be here. I love this city, and I love this community, and I, I thank you all. Thank you. Congratulations, Erin, and thank you so much, Susan. The next honoree in the arts and culture category is Sarah Labrie. Sarah is a singer, conductor, and music educator. She is the artistic director of Quincy Choral Society and lives here in Quincy. She will be introduced by Deborah Jean Parsons, who is on the board of directors of the Quincy Choral. Thank you, Kim. Um, uh, first, I want to thank everyone who made this beautiful and important event possible, Mayor and First Lady Koch, uh, John McDonald and your team, and of course, Abigail Adams. 
Um, I am humbled to be on this stage with all these accomplished women leaders in Quincy, and I'm honored to present this amazing and talented woman, Sarah Labrie. I am... I am speaking on behalf of the over 80 members of the Quincy Choral Society who are here, many who are here. We are so proud of and happy for you, Sarah. We first met Sarah uh, when she was a guest performer in one of our concerts in 2019. And when our artistic director left mid-season, he recommended Sarah to be our interim director. Sarah completely embraced the interim position, and as we went through our search process for a new director, there was no one who was as qualified and as dedicated as Sarah, which made her a natural choice for our chorus. But more importantly, and for this auspicious occasion, Sarah is the first female director we have had in our 42-year history. As you can read in her bio, Sarah is an accomplished conductor, vocalist, and teacher, including being backup vocalist for Sarah Brightman, Andrea Bocelli, and Josh Groban. <laughs> Sarah has performed and currently performed professionally in numerous courses, including Tanglewood Festival Chorus, New York Philharmonic, Boston Symphony Orchestra, and Boston Pops, just to name a few. And Sarah's 2014 choral performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony with Westminster Choir and the Vienna Chamber Orchestra was nominated for a Grammy. But what her resume doesn't reveal is the incredible energy, enthusiasm, and love that she brings to every practice, every rehearsal, every performance. We practice on Monday nights from 7.30 to 9.30. And in the fall and winter, Monday nights are dark and cold, and it feels really late. But without fail, Sarah stands up and says, Happy Monday! Let's stand! And she continues and maintains that energy throughout the night, inspiring all of us to meet her energy and perform to the highest standards. Sarah not only brings exuberance and excellence to our chorus, she also has embraced every opportunity to bring Quincy Choral Society into the fabric of Quincy. And this past year, she moved to Quincy. And when I asked her, <laughs> and when I asked her why, she said this, moving to Quincy felt so natural for us. When I was offered the position of QCS Artistic Director in November 2019, the choir immediately treated me like family. At the time, I was living in Dorchester, and my partner was living in Braintree. 
We had been trying to navigate the housing market for quite some time, looking to purchase our first home. And though we told ourselves we might need to be flexible about location in order to afford our mortgage, we couldn't stop gravitating towards Quincy. The rich history, the high value placed on culture and arts, and the kindness and generosity of the community are just a few of the reasons we chose Quincy. We knew that for us, this was the place to put down roots and grow. I look forward to many, many more years in Adam Shore. And Sarah, we look forward to many, many more years as you, as our leader, congratulations on this well-deserved award. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Deborah Jean, for your beautiful and meaningful speech. Um, I, I am so honored to be standing here with these amazing women and honorees, and I'm so grateful to you for your support, both in and out of QCS. Um, your kindness is endless, and your presence is sunshine. And Deborah Jean sits in the front row of the soprano section, and I can always count that her eyes will meet mine when I look at her in rehearsals. <laughs> Thank you to uh, Mayor Koch and First Lady Christine Koch and the City Arts Councilor John McDonald for all you've done to put this ceremony together. We are so lucky to be in a city with leaders like you who provide support and opportunities for local artists and musicians like us. Because of you, we're able to put on phenomenal collaborative performances like the annual City of Quincy Pops concert out here on the Hancock Adams Common. It happens in early September with our dear friends at the Quincy Symphony Orchestra. Thank you to all of you, to all of our supporters, near and far, friends and family of QCS who believe in the value of community music making. Everyone and anyone can make music, and singing can help bring communities together across generations, social classes, income brackets, and ability in a way that no other medium can. Our choir is like a family. We love, we accept, and we always lift each other up. To the QCS Executive Board and all of the members who are here today, thank you for coming to support me, um, for your guidance, your support, your unconditional love for the past four seasons together has meant the world to me. When I was brought as an, as an interim director in November 2019, we only had a very short time to put together what would have been our concert in March 2020. <laughs> But of course, that concert never happened. Over those few months, a committee was conducting interviews for the next full-time artistic director. My interview was set for the week after the concert. That never happened. <laughs> um, I thought perhaps I'd never see the choir again. We, we had a rehearsal on a Monday evening and said, see you on Saturday for the dress rehearsal. Um, and in those moments, I thought, oh my goodness, I'll never see this choir again. <laughs> Um, in lockdown, when I got um, Cindy Fidua, who was our president at the time, when I got her phone call, I was very surprised, um, and I thought, um, I was just in shock. I thought I'd never see the choir again, and when she told me that the board had decided to offer me the position, I could hardly contain myself. Like everyone else, I was at home in my pajamas for a couple weeks, not knowing what to do with myself. I had no teaching, I had no choir, and we didn't know when we were going to return to those things. Um, I will never take for granted the chance that these amazing people took on me. Thank you for believing in me and for believing in what we could build together with our Quincy Choral Society family. I look forward to many, many more years together of joyful community music. After all, happy people make better music together. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much.
And congratulations to Sarah, and thank you so much to DJ. Next up, Cynthia Sierra is honored in the health and wellness category. Cynthia is the chief executive officer at Manic Community Health Center, and she is going to be introduced by the president of the board of Manit. That's Grace Murphy McCulloch, who will introduce her. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I would like to thank Mayor Koch, of course, and the First Lady for putting together this fantastic event and for all of you for being here. Uh, I am Grace Murphy McAuliffe, and I proudly serve as the president of the Manic Community Health Center Board. It is my privilege to introduce to you today a truly remarkable person whom I admire and respect and so, who so greatly embodies the Abigail Adams legacy, and that is Cynthia Sierra, Manit's chief executive officer. Although she is not from Quincy originally, she does, her love for and contributions to the city are unmistakable. Uh, separated by 200 so odd years, I imagine if they were to have met, Abigail and Cynthia would have gotten along famously because they share so many wonderful traits and qualities. Abigail was noted for her wisdom and her intelligence, a true influencer of time when women were to be quiet. Uh, she was known as a strong female voice in the American Revolution, an early advocate for women's rights. She opposed slavery and supported women's education, radical ideas for the time. What may be lesser known is that Abigail Adams was also a staunch health advocate. She frequently dispensed medical advice in her correspondence. She was credited with helping to encourage smallpox inoculations during the smallpox outbreak of 1776. In 1776, when the Continental soldiers returning from a failed military campaign in Canada brought smallpox to Boston and Quincy, at that time, treatment and prevention options were almost non-existent, except for a rudimentary and very controversial form of immunization known as inoculation. Inoculation in 1776 was a multi-week ordeal requiring quarantine, having likely very significant and serious side effects, in fact, the prevention was often fatal. At the onset of the outbreak, Abigail took action to inoculate herself and her four children, all under the age of 11. While John was away at the Philadelphia Second Continental Congress, he was overseeing the drafting and approval of the Declaration of Independence. So clearly an intense time for the Adams family. The idea of a brave woman stepping forward towards an extreme public health crisis, well, this rings true in current times as well. As you can see by reading her bio, Cynthia's healthcare credentials are substantial and they're impressive. Her knowledge and her understanding of public health were never so sought after as they were during the first days of the COVID-19 pandemic. She rapidly mobilized the health center's early and ongoing response in close partnership with Mayor Koch, his administration, and the city of Quincy. They were able to first help test to, to contain and identify and later vaccinate thousands of people in the city of Quincy and the communities well beyond. It's not content to simply lead Manit through the crisis. Cynthia served as the go-to collaborator for so many other organizations' leaders who called her for assistance and guidance. Cynthia gave her time selfishly. Cynthia possesses a rare combination of keen intellect, thoughtful kindness, and steely strength. She's also humble to a fault, and I know as much as she is honored to be among the awardees today, she is quietly wishing for me to stop talking so the spotlight will no longer be on her. <laughs> but I have just a few more things to say. As those of you who know her will tell you, Cynthia has almost superhuman stamina, born of countless laps at the YMCA pool in the wee hours of the morning, long before I've hit the snooze button. She is often the first person at the health center and the last to leave. And then she continues working at home until many of us have started counting the sheep. Cynthia selflessly abides by the same code articulated by Abigail Adams in 1778. If we do not lay ourselves out in the service of mankind, whom shall we serve? She serves as a teacher and a mentor to her staff at all levels, from the executive team to the front desk, many of whom are here with us tonight, today. Uh, her counsel is sought by elected officials on the local, state, and national level because her knowledge and her passion for helping others and doing good work. In fact, Cynthia is just this week leading a delegation to Washington, D.C. to bring Massachusetts Community Health Center issues to Capitol Hill. 
Cynthia applies her clinical background in psychology to help her understand people and what makes them tick. As anyone who's been across from a negotiating table from Cynthia will tell you, she is no pushover. She will fight for who and what she believes in and is absolutely unapologetic in her pursuit of social justice and health equity. Yes, I can imagine if Cynthia and Abigail were sitting here today enjoying a cup of tea, they would have much to talk about. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Cynthia Sierra. Thank you, Grace. Honored to be in your company. Thank you. Truly, thank you for your service. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Koch. Thank you. It's terrific to be uh, here for such a wonderful occasion. Mayor, thank you for this event. John, thank you for this event. And I do need to add about the mayor. Uh, thank you for supporting and championing women's leadership. And it's truly, truly, in my experience, not by design. It's who you are. And uh, it means much. So please, please know that. Speaking of female leadership, and I have actually taken off my distance glasses, so I just have my reading. But my goodness, we're surrounded by Manet female leadership, both employed and both volunteer. I can see in the audience, Linda Kelly, I know that you're here. You're, you're up here. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, also, esteemed uh, Grace with us today, former Manet Bass board presidents. I see Eva Greenwood, our dear friend Eva Greenwood, thank you for being here. I believe Marsha Roos may be here as well. And of course, female leader, former board president, Alicia Gardner, thank you for being here. And Manit's female staff leadership, all of us have the capacity to be leaders. And, uh, and if I've left any of our uh, terrific male board members out, Grace, you'll apologize for me. Thank you, thank you. And now my reading glasses. Um, so man, it's on the cusp of its 45th year, and the city is so incredibly important for folks that may not understand. We exist, if you will, and we stand on the shoulders of our founders, our founding city residents, our founding board members, and our founding first patients. But the very existence of this health center is only, only because of the city of Quincy. So, so proper in this Women's History Month to also acknowledge Man at uh, an organization that is so proud to be looking towards the future, but always recognizing our past. Manet has frankly been blessed over the course of these last several years. We grew 25% in patient volume from 2021 to 2022. Uh, we have the pleasure and the honor of being led by our patients and a consumer majority board. They tell us, the community tells us, all of you tell us, our staff and our patients tell us that we are not done. And so our services expand in terms of primary care, in terms of addiction and recovery, in terms of mental health. Even this year alone, we look forward to, and with the mayor's support, it must be said, uh, opening up x-ray, opening up mammography inside of North Quincy. We're also partnering with our good friends at Father Bill's in Main Spring and opening up a clinic there later this year. And so it's truly our honor to continue to serve. Um, I'll say uh, I find that I love to work, but I love this work. Uh, there's just such an incredible amount of joy when you have that opportunity of working for your patients and you're joined every day by a staff, uh, including operations and professionals, including physicians, including nurse practitioners and mid-levels. Uh, Dr. Jean Hopkins is here, the director of our vision center. Staff across all disciplines, whether it be communications, fundraising, operations, that they walk through those doors every day and the health center is far more than a job to them. It truly is a mission to make sure that care exists for everyone and that we leave no one behind. So uh, again, uh, a pleasure and an honor to serve and to serve in this wonderful city. So thank you so much.
like to congratulate Cynthia and thank Grace so much. The last honoree of the day is in the nonprofit category. Beth Ann Strollo is the Chief Executive Officer at Quincy Community Action Programs. Unfortunately, Beth Ann cannot be with us today. However, her friend and colleague, Kathy Murphy, will share a bit about her. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, First Lady Christine Koch. It's been wonderful uh, being with you today. Thank you, Mayor Koch, for <clears throat> this celebration of women in our community. It's, it's wonderful. Um, congratulations to all the recipients. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> I can't get over any of you. So I have the pleasure of um, introducing another wow in our community, Beth Ann Strollo. Beth Ann Strollo is CEO of Quincy Community Action Programs, which is fondly known in our community as QCAMP. I've known Beth Ann for probably 25 years. <clears throat> I know her professionally and personally and had the pleasure of serving on her board for quite a number of years <clears throat> and watching Beth Ann in operation uh, close and up front. It was by a wonderful twist of fate and good fortune that this community came to win the heart and commitment of Beth Ann Strollo for the long term. In the mid-1980s, Beth Ann was living in her home state of Ohio, ready for a change of environment and ready for a change of job. She leafed through the local newspaper and the library, answered an ad for fiscal director at Quincy Community Action Programs, and that began her story. Shortly thereafter, Quin uh, Beth Ann won the job at QCAP, and Quincy won a big heart and a big mind. And what followed for Beth Ann was a personal and professional love story. Beth Ann needed a place to live when she arrived in Boston, so she interviewed with different people that she met in the newspaper. She was interviewed by Mark, Heather, and Michael, who welcomed her in as, her, as their roommate. From that moment forward, that interview, that acceptance of a job, Beth Ann's future in terms of her family, best friends, and professional mission were solidified. Beth Ann joined QCAP. Beth Ann fell in love with her roommate, Mark, and eventually they married. Beth Ann and Mark's other roommates, Michael and Heather, also married. The two couples moved in together, bought a two-family home, and began their families. Beth Ann and Mark, and, uh, I'm sorry, Beth Ann, as so many of us know, is remarkably committed to this community. But her dearest personal loves are her wonderful, amazing son, Christopher, and her kind, thoughtful husband and soulmate, Mark. At QCAP from the part, start, Beth Ann loved the mission, loved the community, and loved the opportunity to help others address life's hurdles in a positive and forward-thinking manner. Grace and other people here today commented to me on Beth Ann's commitment, and I thought I should share that, because each of the individuals here with all of their contributions to the community also are part of Beth Ann's community. And refer to her as somebody who's always available to them. Beth Ann remained with QCAP as fiscal director for many years. And when Rosemary retired, she was ready and pleased to assume leadership. For background, when Beth Ann started with QCAP, she loved the mission, loved the community, and loved the opportunity to help others. When she was fiscal director, she had the mentorship and example of the then QCAP executive director, the wonderful Rosemary Wahlberg. She shared Rosemary's commitment to the needs of others and learned from Rosemary about the community and about the importance of promoting mission and building a community of support around QCAP. Beth Ann remained with QCAP until, as I mentioned, Rosemary retired, at which time she was thrilled to assume leadership of QCAP. <clears throat> She's done a great job. Beth Ann has continued to flourish and understands that to serve others, a program must do more than be available. It must also reach out to find those with needs and offer to help. Hence, it's a focus of Beth Ann to find ways to reach out to the community, ensure that people know about QCAP services and are able to access its programs. She's constantly focused upon ways to create a reliable and professional manner in which to provide services. A platform of Beth Ann's is respect of others, 
in respect of the way her program services are delivered. It's a remarkable reflection of her character. When you drive through our growing, prospering city of Quincy, you can physically see how QCAP has also kept pace, growing, continuing to secure its place and demonstrate its long-term commitment to be a part of and support our community. This reflects Beth Ann's commitment to this community and to the provision of these services. Recently seeing the importance of the QCAP Food Center to the community, Beth Ann led a project to develop a newer and improved food center. Quincy is now privately the home to the wonderful, responsive Southwest Community Food Center. Throughout Quincy, there are multiple units of affordable housing owned and managed by QCAP. When, Qu when QCAP was vulnerable to losing its lease on its space in Quincy Center, Beth Ann looked for ways that QCAP may purchase the building and thereby keep programs and people in one central location that was accessible to the public, accessible to public transportation, and accessible to clients. Beth Ann used her financial background to understand and explore and pursue financing op opportunities. Today, QCAP owns the building it once leased at 1509 Hancock Street and remains there as a permanent presence to help serve our community. When Beth Ann learned that money may be available from the federal government for the building of new Head Start early child care facilities and programs for shovel-ready projects, Beth Ann was right on it. Beth Ann explained to me then personally that shovel ready meant that the project has to be ready to go, so she focused upon making sure the QCAPS project was planned and ready so that it would be competitive in the application for federal funds. She drew on the knowledge she had from her dad, the architect, and her knowledge of the program mission to develop a shovel ready plan for QCAM. She mobilized all the needed support with her polite perseverance. She leaned on politicians, traveled to D.C., shared the story of the program and plan, and met every single challenge and requirement to gaining the funding. Today, as part of our city of Quincy, is the prideful home of the Rosemary and Archie Wahlberg Head Start Center, which serves the early education needs in our community. Beth Ann's desire to improve and empower the lives of others is simply unyielding. Today, at this Remember the Ladies event, in honor of First Lady Abigail Adams, it seems quite fitting to have the chance to salute the accomplishments of Beth Ann and all of these other amazing women. Thank you, Beth Ann, and congratulations on a well-deserved honor. Good afternoon. Thank you, Kathy, for those kind and generous words. I'm so sorry that I'm unable to be with all of you for this very special ceremony. My gratitude to First Lady Christine Koch, Christine for your unsung service to the community for so many years, and to the mayor. Mayor, thank you for selecting me for this honor. You have been so supportive of women over the years in the city and to each of our respective organizations. Thank you for that. Thank you, John McDonald and the event organizers who did all the work behind the scenes. And to my fellow honorees, Cynthia, Aaron, and Sarah, congratulations. It is an honor to be among you. You are a distinguished group of women who have worked to make the community stronger and more vital. It's humbling to receive an award in the name of Abigail Adams, an amazing woman so intelligent, fearless, and courageous to stand up for women when so many disagreed with her. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the many women who mentored, guided, and supported me over the years in the city. Women who paved the way many years ago, like Rosemary Wahlberg, and women who are in my life today, like Kathy Murphy, Josephine Shea, the amazing women on the QCAP Board of Directors, and the women who work with me every day at QCAP. And to the thousands of women that QCAP has served over the years for their bravery as they faced the obstacles in their lives, they've been courageous and resilient. 
They all inspire me and continue to do so. I'm truly grateful for this honor. Thank you. I'm gonna echo what Kathy said and say, wow, wow, wow. We told you these were gonna be remarkable women. Let's give them a round of applause. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Thank you. I don't know, as a news reporter, I cover so much bad that it is wonderful to see all the good that's happening in our communities. As we conclude today's event, I would like to leave you with Abigail's own words. And Sarah, you can help me if you want. Remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. If particular attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. I think she said it all. So with that, we conclude today's event, and the celebration continues right outside with a tea that is going to be catered by Craig's Cafe. Thanks so much for joining us.